moving in progress. Good evening, everybody. We are here for day two of the Blood Sugar Challenge. And I'm so excited to be here tonight with diabetes educator, Sarah Bostinoya. So I've known Sarah for a number of years. And then I was looking back when Sarah actually returned to Bermuda. And Sarah, did you realize it was 30 years ago that you returned to Bermuda? <laughs> So Sarah's trained in, the, in Scotland and in the UK. She's trained as a dietitian and now as a diabetes educator. And if you have diabetes in Bermuda, you know who Sarah Bostinoy is. She worked for many years at King Edward Memorial Hospital before transferring over to her full-time role with the Bermuda Diabetes Association. Sarah's busy on this island. Uh, she does a lot of promotional work um, advocating for diabetes and for just healthy eating. Um, so we're really excited to have her here tonight. She's got lots of experience working with Freestyle Libra, but she's really gonna be sharing just some of the tips that she's had working with diabetics over a number of years. And I know that you all will welcome her in this evening. So let's get her on the big screen. I think I'm gonna unmute you, Sarah. Yes, thank you, and I've unmuted made sense that you uh were you were controlling the mute button thanks for that um I have to do it. i'm gonna make you big <laughs> thank you there we go okay we've got sarah live on the screen <laughs> that's fantastic and i'm not sitting outside of our building on a sunny day but there it is um and full disclosure i have uh an 11 week old puppy in my house who may or may not you know do what i ask her to do and not bark um but thanks uh dr Heen. thank you for the introduction tonight really excited to be able to share uh, with any of you. And as we said, please, um, at any point or at the end of it, feel free to ask me questions um, really uh, relevant. And I feel privileged really to be in diabetes care for 30 years this year that I returned back from uh, Edinburgh where I trained as a registered dietitian. And then I worked at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, came back home to Bermuda. And I think in a, a, the profession of, of diabetes, and nutrition has given me back more in my thir in 30 years than I thought. But here's what I really am fascinated with, and that's the Freestyle Libra um, glucose monitoring device, because take uh, three decades of knowledge that I have learned about uh, nutrition, which is a science which evolves, and the way in which I'm working with clients now is different from what I learned 20 or 30 years ago um, from epidemiology studies and things that have changed. Nutrition is a science and sometimes needs to be um, uh, revamped and, and certainly the way we do things has. But here we have a tool, and I think many of you, if not all of you, right, are, are using the Prisa Libra, um, which shows us glucose patterns minute by minute. And we can see the exact effect on our glucose levels of eating a banana versus eating a, a, a pile of blueberries um, and meal composition and, and all of that. So for 30 years that I've given people a meal plan um, and say what we know about meal plans is they have to be individualized is now we can see in real time how food affects um, everybody on a very individual basis. I think food journaling is incredibly important with the Freestyle Libra, and I'm sure you all are doing that, and that's part of the, um, the program that I looked at uh, in the syllabus that you're all doing. Because you can see um, glucose is never on a flat line all day. Every food that we eat that contains carbohydrate, all three, all every food we eat it bro gets broken down into one of three nutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And carbohydrate is the nutrient which breaks down into glucose. And carbohydrate breaks down into glucose, whether it's a sweet, uh, simple sugar, um, like a bowl of sherbet, or whether it's a stock complex carbohydrate, such as a bowl of brown rice. What we're learning and what we learned all along, and I think when we, we look at the exciting field of diabetes reversal and diabetes remission, which we now know is possible, if I consider and explain to people that, that diabetes or the prevention of diabetes and prevention of prediabetes involves really looking um, very categorically at the carbohydrates we're eating. Carbohydrates are nutrients which we consume for energy. If we don't burn off that energy, we will store that extra energy as fat. When we store that extra energy as fat in and around our liver, it can contribute to inflammation in a process called insulin resistance. When we look at what we're eating uh, with the Freestyle Libra, and I, and I do ask people to be very conscious and, and look at, at the impact of lowering carbohydrate intakes, what we've learned is it's not just simply lowering carbohydrate intake, which obviously makes a big difference on your carbohydrate, on your glucose excursions, but meal 
composition, I think, has a, a, a multitude of, of, we've now understood the magnitude of the importance of what we eat with carbohydrates, not just how much carbohydrate we eat. When we take in protein and fat with a meal, protein delays gastric emptying, as does fat. So that means that food stays in our stomach longer. So that when we pair a carbohydrate that we're eating with protein and with some healthy fat, we will noticeably see a, a much more stable glucose curve after we've eaten that. So that means, as, and, and, and Tiffany, I joked about it, no, no naked carbs. We try not to eat any carbs on their own. They need to be dressed up with something or they need to be sitting beside something on your plate. And for people with diabetes or blood sugar challenges who've often been afraid of eating fruit, this takes on a whole new way of, of eating fruit. So we, first of all, would much prefer to, to look at choosing fruits which have a lower glycemic index. And glycemic index is the rate at which that food is gonna turn into glucose. Cold winter fruits that have had a frost, apples, berries, all berries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, pears, and to a certain extent, citrus as well, have a lower glycemic index than do our tropical uh, counterparts, mangoes, bananas, pineapple, all the things that you have on a holiday wearing a bathing suit. They're not the friends. The, those are the fruits that are gonna raise your glucose levels quickly. They have a high glycemic index. So when we're looking at trying to lower carbohydrate intake with fruits, I typically tell people to try and limit to two fruit servings a day. And when you have fruit, to pair it with a carb with, to pair it with protein, a handful of almonds, walnuts, a small baby bell cheese, a little bit of feta cheese, feta and, and, uh, and fruit goes quite nicely together, and a scoop of, or a scoop of peanut butter or almond nut butter. So that protein and that fruit really makes a difference. We see it also, I think one of the biggest things I've seen as a registered dietitian working with the Libra is the, the change and shift we have to have for breakfast foods. 30 years ago when I graduated, the whole world was in a low fat era and we all had to have fat-free foods and there was fat-free Pringles and fat-free cookies, snack balls, cookies. And we all thought this was the way to go. When they reduce fat in a food, it increases sugar or carbohydrate consumption. So back in, in the days of low fat eating, a bowl of, of, of Cheerios with a skim milk and a banana would have been considered a very healthy breakfast. What we're gonna see now with the Freestyle Libra that you couldn't have um, a breakfast which would turn into glucose more readily than a bowl of cereal and fruit um, because it's low in fat and high in carbohydrate and relatively low in protein. So we're really bringing protein back into breakfast where a lot of us wake up a little bit insulin resistant anyway, because having slept overnight, our bodies are a little bit sluggish in dealing with carbohydrates. So let's bring the eggs back. Let's throw some spinach in there. Let's give an opportunity to add some vegetables at breakfast, make a breakfast fatata, make some scrambled egg muffin cups, um, even just boiling an egg uh, and putting some avocado on, on toast. Um, bring in those healthy fats, bring in the healthy uh, proteins with a small amount of carbohydrate at breakfast for a much more stable, Blood, blood glucose curve, then after we see pancakes and bagels and English muffins and croissants and all of those breakfast foods, which are namely all carbohydrate. Um, so, so, and lunch and dinner, we tend to assimilate some sort of protein and vegetables. And that's been, you know, that, that sort of comes into it. But I think for many decades, most of our go-to breakfast on the runs have been very high in carbohydrate. And for a lot of people, just switching up that meal at breakfast and shifting the focus to a healthy protein and a healthy fat source really makes all the difference. And that can keep your glucose levels in target for the rest of the day if you can stabilize them at breakfast by making protein front and center on your breakfast plate and adding some healthy fats to it. So I'll sort of pause for there, because I said we wanted to you know, just take that for about 10, 12 minutes. And I'd really like to entertain any questions from any of you. Um, I've learned a great deal over the, over the years and shifted my thinking in terms of a lot of it, but I think in the last five to 10 years, since we know that diabetes remission and reversal is possible, we've always known that pre-diabetes was, was entirely possible to prevent and reverse that, to get glucose levels back to normal. But if we can reboot what the liver does in our bodies by sort of creating that insulin resistance, we can, and we can do that categorically by making these lifestyle changes, shifting a little bit of the nutrients and the portion sizes that we eat and you'll see that in your glucose results and patterns on your Freestyle Libra. Well, this is wonderful, Sarah, and you've got so much uh, to share, you know, and it's, it's interesting, the transition 
And I'm glad you brought that up from that world that we had of, you know, that low fat. And low fat. Yeah. And that's when I was going through medical school. I remember eating the granola bars and everyone was talking about, you know, why they were feeling so hungry all the time. That's and right. so now we have this world of the everything being balanced. So um, I guess we'll start to take, there's a few, there's a question here in the chat. Maybe we'll start with that one. And if anyone else has a question, what I'm going to do is um, I'll put it down into gallery so I can see you all, I think. And there's uh, a question there about what is intermittent fasting. Is that right? What about intermittent fasting? Yes. What about intermittent fasting for breakfast? Uh, absolutely not a problem. And, and thank you for that question. I mean, again, clinical registered dietitian 20 years ago, I would have said absolutely not. Let, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You've got to have three meals a day. And when I look at the meal plans, we, a registered dietitian would have done years ago, would be breakfast and a snack and lunch and a snack. And, and you're always in a fed state. There's a lot of new evidence now to suggest that if we know if we eat a meal, that food will be in our system for about four hours, peaking at about two hours after we eat. So I don't know what your instruction there is to have people checking two hours after to see where that glucose level is after you what you've eaten. So we really need to give the body a good four hours after we eat to really assimilate that glucose curve. From, from that meal. If we're constantly having snacks all over the place, then we're in a fed state versus a fasted state. And that's typically putting glucose back into your liver, potentially storing it as fat if you're not burning it up. So periods of longer time when you are, are um, in, in a fasted state, I think have become um, more popular. And certainly what we recognize is that not only is it not perhaps causing any harm, but putting you in a, in, in, a, in a position to burn some of that or utilize some of that stored fat in your liver. There's a great word um, to know that it's gluconeogenesis. It's a great scrabble word if you've got all those letters on your board, but that is the process of breaking down protein and fat in your liver to create much needed glucose. So when you're fasting, intermittent fasting, taking that window through breakfast and not eating till 11 or 12 o'clock, during the day, you're driving your car to work, you're brushing your hair, you're having a shower, your body requires glucose. And if you're not eating that glucose, it's going to be taking that glucose uh, from the stored fat in your liver and getting rid of some of that, which we know is quite a good thing because excessive, um, this sort of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is what's contributing to some of the metabolic abnormalities that we see, which are the precursors um, to type two diabetes and many other there it goes, dogs are barking, my apologies. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought that up, Sarah, you know, because we do see when you talk about diabetes reversal, something like adding fasting to your program or your regimen is really one of those things because it literally gives the body time to get the liver cleaned up when right. we just stop eating. Because the body's right. pretty smart, right? It does know what to do. And again, we are talking about right now type two diabetics, right? We're not talking right. about the type Absolutely. one just to clarify that the, the distinction between diabetes remission and reversal is a conversation only in and around type two diabetes. Um, and, and, you know, what the liver, when somebody's on insulin, um, and taking insulin, it's a very different mechanism. We're talking about, um, the potential really where we're trying to, um, look at stable blood glucose levels and preventing insulin resistance in type two diabetes or pre-diabetes where creatures are very you know, in, intelligent, designed as human beings for hundreds and hundreds of years, that feast and famine, we would eat a meal, catch, catch an, a lion or a beast, and then potentially not eat for a few days after. So that's where we learn to store these foods as fat. And that is primarily, that's the energy source. Right now, we're not chasing lions and bears. We've got Twinkies and food available to us 24 seven, which, which is a problem um, and because we're not letting our body have that sort of fasted state, have a meal, a couple of hours later, have another meal. And the other problem is of course, is that we're not you know, doing the activity that we did years ago. So combine that with looking at carbohydrates as a fuel source and thinking how we don't sit down and say, well, I'm going to be this much active for the next four hours. So here's how much carbohydrate I eat. People don't look like we don't eat like that. We just eat because carbohydrates taste nice. And nobody came running after you with a green bean when you fell off your bike. Your mother or your granny came after you with a lollipop or a cookie. So we associate carbohydrates with quite nice things as well. So all of this is behavior. And Tiffany knows that I, I quite, I, you know, we put those foods in. Where are they going to come in? Where do we use that word moderation and and figure out how they all fit in. And I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's the number one leading cause now of liver transplants. 
So yeah. it really is something that needs to be recognized and know that it can be, it can be overcome too. That can be reversed. So we have and a question. As you said, is that fat is coming from not fat. We've talked about right. non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases from excessive carbohydrates which my body, which the insulin has, what is it known to do? The extra insulin, when my muscle cells are full and glycogen, it takes it to the liver and it stores it as fat. And so the predominant source of that fat in stored in the liver is an excessive intake of carbohydrate that we're not burning off. That's right. Remember, it's the carbs, not the fat. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, you know, a lot of health care professionals out there that don't quite get that part either, right? It's the mm -hmm. sugar and the carbs that matter. So questions about fasting. So will black coffee break a fast and do vitamins break a fast? No, no. People can continue yeah, with, with a black coffee with no milk in it. it. You will not cause any glucose excursion. Now, funnily enough, a lot of people type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes will see on your freestyle Libras that caffeine in a black cup, cup of black coffee might cause a glucose spike. And that's the caffeine, the adrenaline kind of a spike that we see sometimes. And some of my patients with type one diabetes actually have to give a unit or so of insulin for a cup of coffee. But when we're talking about the caloric and, and breaking that fast and causing um, uh, sort of an insulin response, it shouldn't happen with coffee being black without milk, um, nor uh, taking vitamins. Although um, as, a, as a dietitian, I've always said that we do get um, much better absorption um, and bioavailability of a, a vitamin supplement if you do take it with food. So even if you're skipping breakfast, maybe you want to take your vitamin supplement with lunch or the first time that you eat. Yeah, especially the fat soluble ones too, like the vitamin Correct. D, if people are taking the vitamin D. Really um, increases the availability of it. Yes, to have it with some food. And a question, Sarah, one thing that came up was things that spike people's um, on the uh, Freestyle Libra monitor. So a few people have commented that, you know, with ex with intense exercise, we'll see the, in the sugar levels go up, sometimes even with a hot shower. Are there other, and like now you mentioned about the coffee from the caffeine spike, are there other areas where it kind of goes up unexpectedly? So it's, it's, a, it's an adrenaline response like that, right? And it is stress too. I mean, you know, and you probably can speak on the part of physicians. It's hard when we discuss the effect of stress because it's not measurable. You're not having eight ounces of stress today versus 16 ounces of stress yesterday. Anything that causes the body to have that sort of adrenaline kind of effect. So um, people will notice more with weights or an aerobic or a burst of energy if you're running a sprint, a gentle walk, um, but you know, if you're fast pacing, cycling, if you're doing something, a real burst of aerobic activity or anaerobic lifting weights, you will see, um, and that again is as a sudden demand for glucose by the muscles um, because it, it needs an increased source of it. And so it says, hey, liver, come on, shoot me some more glucose. And that's what causes that spike. The stress you know, you just put the phone down from a company that you're arguing with a bill or something like that, or you've got off, you know, you kicked the cat or tripped over, you know, bumped your car and you're stressed in the parking lot. That stress causes, again, that same adrenaline release, that fight or flight. And as I like to compare to people going out in an army 30 years ago on horseback with a sword and shield, and you've got 300 men coming towards you with a shield. Well, that was our body's response is to get the adrenaline to get that glucose going well in modern day times we're not fighting in an army like that anymore but that same reaction to stress causes the body to uh, increase and release of glucose um, through those adrenaline type hormones so not measurable it will be stress um, in, in any shape or form it can be intense exercise it can be caffeine um, illness, illness can cause a spike as well. So if you're fighting a, a, a not a, not a spike, but you might generally see that if you're um, uh, fighting a cold, fighting an infection, you might see for a few days your sugars might run a little bit higher for some people. I think there was a question about a spike in sleep. Sleep yes. shouldn't cause it to spike. <laughs> sleep should be putting your body into resting mode. Um, I don't know if you're having a dream about battling a dragon. I'm not sure, but generally sleep doesn't cause uh, a spike and, you know, or, or a sleep supplement like chamomile or melatonin. No, it, it shouldn't. Not really. The times I start to see some, not so much spikes, but overall high values is with sleep apnea. And, you know, I screen yeah. so many patients because sleep apnea is a stress on the body, right? They're, you're losing your oxygen. So you're going hypoxic and the body's like, I'm in stress mode. 
uh, what's the interesting to say about stress? And we're talking about again this this um, the, the early stages of insulin resistance or pre-diabetes. When we talk about pre-diabetes, there are two different conditions: impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. And a lot of people, if you go to, and, and you've got a screening done by your doctor and your waking up levels are a little bit higher, what's happening while you sleep is that liver is leaking or putting out too much glucose overnight. So some people, maybe the question that was asked here in the chat was, you can see on your freestyle Libra, some people wake up and they say, gosh, I haven't eaten anything and my sugar is starting to go up or it's starting to climb a little bit before I wake up. And that is what I call your hepatic or your liver's release of glucose. People with diabetes type one will see that too. It's called the dawn phenomenon as your body's getting ready to wake up. It's like an engine or a refrigerator suddenly coming on in a room and it gets ready with this burst of glucose being released. Um, but in type two diabetes, what we're trying to do in clean up or reboot this liver and, 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 and really getting rid of this um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is to stop that liver from being so what's the word to him, negligent or leaky in, in that capacity to release too much glucose. And it happens when we're waking up in the morning. Some people say, I haven't done a darn thing. I haven't eaten anything. And I see if I do nothing, my glucose levels rise slowly in the morning. And that's coming from the liver. That's great, Sarah. And what about the opposite, a drop in sleep when the well, glucose goes down? Mm -hmm. that's good. I mean, if anything, to be honest, if it's, if it's not too low, then that's a good thing. That shows me that your liver is not acting up and releasing too much glucose as you sleep. And we should be going into resting mode overnight and it shouldn't be, you know, a, a leaking, you shouldn't have too much glucose produced overnight. You should have, you know, every minute of the day, every hour, we are, our liver and our pancreas is regulating our glucose levels in a normal range all day long if we don't have diabetes. So there's a little bit of insulin release, regulating it in a normal range. And there's a little bit of uh, glucose being released by the liver when we're not eating. If you and I, if all of us were sitting on an airplane and it was pulled over on a runway and we didn't have, we had a diversion for five or six hours. If we didn't have diabetes, we weren't on meds. Our liver should take care of that by keeping our glucose levels regulated. Um, so when you go to sleep at night and your glucose levels are regulated, they're going down somewhat, they're not going up, then your blood sugar, then your liver is doing what it's supposed to do. One thing I've noticed, Sarah, is if I have alcohol, um, and it doesn't even have to always be a lot, I think it depends on what I eat, but I have gone low at down, night. Gone down, absolutely. Yeah. So good point there. Try not to make that, I try not, to, my patients not to make that correlation that if you have a glass of wine at night, sometimes your glucose levels are better, but it's happening because what organ in the body is it that regulates alcohol when we drink it and it's the liver. So for every unit of alcohol consumed, a glass of wine, an ounce of spirit or whatever that is, the liver is basically shut off for two hours, meaning for two hours to process or detoxify that alcohol, it's not available to leak that glucose. So the busy, the energy of the liver has gone into detoxifying the alcohol. So if we've had two drinks, that's four hours or six, three drinks, that's a couple of hours where it hasn't been overproducing that glucose, all its energy has been gone into detoxifying the alcohol. Does that make sense? So it's it's, it's using its energy in a different direction. So sometimes alcohol will cause the blood glucose levels not to have spiked or been so higher that the next morning, in fact, they're lower. Right, and I know in the ER, you know, we used to give, if an alcoholic came in, we would have to give them glucose in a drip because their sugars were often low. But we also know everyone that alcohol is toxic to your liver, right? Yeah, and, and so FYI, that, that's the hangover, isn't it? So, I mean, again, that, that, that hangover that if anybody has ever had one in their life, that, that feeling grotty and a headache the next morning, your glucose is low and you're dehydrated. So when you reach for a can of nasty sweet drink and a fried egg sandwich, you feel better because you're having some liquid back into you and getting your glucose levels back up, but not recommend, we're not yeah. advocating for hangovers at all because you're not putting your liver in any state of, of fun by doing that. But that does explain why a glass of wine or a glass of alcoholic beverage may see your glucose levels be lower the next morning. And I want to put just one more plug, though, kind of against alcohol, because, you know, I'll just say that alcohol, I feel, has become so culturally acceptable, especially here in Bermuda, but even, you know, in Canada in the summertime as people are out. But it really is something that can do a lot of harm in our body. Um, we do need that time for our body to clean itself. So just like we're talking about, we talk about fasting, how it can be so good for you. So think about giving your body a break from alcohol if you do like it. Save it for a glass or two in the weekend, but try not to make it a nightly thing because your liver needs time to detoxify. Right. And, and they're empty, empty non-nutritive calories, right? So I tell people, think about that budget. Where are you spending your calories? 
um, people under underestimate the caloric impact really of a couple of drinks too. You can easily be up to a thousand calories with two or three drinks. Um, and, and, and it's a quite, it's an easy fix to take those out. And as, as you say, to, to just to kind of make the body feel a whole lot better because the liver can get back to processing what it's supposed to be doing. So now we had some kind of talking about stress. Maybe someone recently had surgery and do surgeries or healing, um, period causing issue with blood sugars. So the, the healing time basically after a surgery, will that elevate the blood sugar? Absolutely. Um, any kind of metabolic repair your body's trying to do and wound healing um, in, in will impart that. So we often will notice and, and specifically on the ward when I was in the hospital on the wards, if people are recovering from surgery, a lot of times they that's when they're started on a little bit more aggressive blood glucose medication to get because we need glucose levels. It's a, it's a chicken and an egg sort of situation. The you want the blood sugars to be well controlled in order to facilitate better wound healing. So if you don't, if you have high blood sugars, it's going to impact wound healing. If you are healing from something um, that the stress of that, the metabolic stress in the body will push sugars up. So you want to not accept that if anything's, um, if you, if anybody's going through that, you, you contact your GP and say, listen, I'm, you know, getting over something, healing from a surgery, that wound's not healing well, my sugars are high. Let's get a little bit more of an aggressive approach to it with, with what you need to do to bring them down into normal. Great. And someone asked about having warm lemon water in the morning. Um, they noticed a little bit of a spike in their blood sugar. So they're taking it because they want to detox in the morning, you know, and is it okay to drink lem warm lemon water in the morning? You know, it's, it's, that's mostly hydration. I don't think you're seeing any carbohydrate. Lemon juice doesn't have any carbohydrate per se. Um, it's not the, I would doubt that it's the warm lemon juice that's causing that spike. Um, having water when you wake up to flush your system out is, is, is always a good idea. A lot of people think that that lemon juice is um, doing something, you know, the further to it, but I think it's another shot of vitamin C. It shouldn't be the spike. It might just be correlating with that little spike that you're seeing when you're waking up. Um, continue, you know, sort of, albeit continue with it as long as it's not but a, a shot of honey or, or, or um, molasses in there. Some people will drink other things when they're drinking apple cider, putting a lot of sugar in that, then you're going to see a spike to it. But if it's just warm water and, uh, and, and hot lemon juice, not a problem. Not me, you know, you put the, the uh, crushed lem lemon in there. I know I swear by it when I've got a cold. The first thing I do is run straight to the store, buy six lemons, cut, cut them all up, juice them all up, and with some hot boiling water. And that's the best way to get vitamin C into you. And I think, you know, the other is that, like you mentioned, the apple cider vinegar. And a lot of people do take that, you know, in the morning. It can have its, like, you know, it is a, a natural kind of probiotic, right? Because mm -hmm. and also these things in the morning can get your digestive juices going. So I find some people like, especially that are older, you know, our digestive enzymes often kind of go down a little bit, which is why people get a lot more gas and bloating sometimes as they're older. And so um, if people want to try this, I don't think there's, like you said, there's no uh, harm. And a lot of people find it, it's a good beginning to their day. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's very individual. And if it works for you, just, and I think don't let it take away what it, my messages are. And people start to think, oh, I have a drink of this every morning. It's doing this. I said, don't, think that that might be doing everything because it sort of takes away from all the rest of the work that you're doing in, in what we're eating. The main, you know, it really is when my 30 years of doing nutrition talks and presentations, and it might move me to is really look at it at a seesaw, like two children on a seesaw at a playing field. It really becomes the hard work of what we're doing for energy expenditure that we're burning up and physical activity and energy in. And so, you know, if we think that one other thing that we can do a pill or a drink or this is going to turn that all into, into magic numbers, it's not. It really is the hard work of what you're all doing with what we're eating and what we're physical activity, um, which is really gonna get you to the end of the road. We can't outrun your fork is another expression I use. So 80% of where you're gonna go on this journey really is with food and nutrition and what you're putting into your body and what we eat. Um, the rest of it is physical activity is, is hugely important, as I said, because we're then we're burning that glucose as an energy substrate instead of storing it. But what does kind of make me wary for people is when you see someone trying to tell you, sell you this or say, drink this in the morning, this will take care of everything. No, it won't. It might be an adjunct or it might be something that you do as well as, but not to take away from the good of everything else. Great. Now, someone's mentioning that sugars went from like six to seven. Now, that would be Canadian, then dropping Minimal. down. To, yeah. yeah um, and then dropping down to the 3.1 range. 
and they were kind of asking about that is could that be a concern all in the morning is that I'm not quite sure about um, the ask is yeah I, I just I don't of, know. they've just seen it kind of go go down that's kind of the end of the question so it really depends Savannah um, really for mm -hmm. those sorts of things it depends over what time frame that's happening yeah because sometimes a 3.1 remember this is interstitial um, sh blood exactly. that we, or sugar levels that we're measuring it's not the same as your blood glucose levels. So um, next week, what we're gonna do and reminder for everyone is we're gonna analyze some people's numbers. So we're gonna pull up your, your um, upload some of your data on the screens and then we'll be able to go through those specific patterns to see what's going on with individuals. Can't emphasize, I have checked on my math, that is that is uh, low, can, what we would consider here, but I do tell people all the time, if you're not on medication, we have to be really clear that the scans of the free cell Libra are measuring interstitial glucose values, which are different from capillary blood glucose values. And the Freestyle Libra training that we received, the Abbott will advocate the only time that you might put a, a finger stick along or put a strip in there and test your glucose if you're getting a low reading, um, because you might find that that's significantly higher. It's just there's a lag time between the blood glucose delivering that glucose around to the interstitial fluid. So, um, you know, never be too concern but if, if you're on medication or glucose lowering medication you might want to check that but but for the most part if you're just looking at what we're doing and many times that I've worn the free cell libra for you too you've seen it where we, we just run low for a day and that's if I was finger pricking it would be in a much different range and she said it was at night so for sure she just said <clears throat> and you know often at night we could see a number like that yeah um, and is there any other reasons that sugars would go at night why they would go low without the alcohol like i know one thing they mentioned is some people if they lay on their sensor it can give them falsely low readings yep. um are there other times you see people go low um i mean not without alcohol no we do have and this is something you know over five years now we've, we've had the sensor here in bermuda for three four years and so i'm putting people on it every day every week I think what we have to, to also anticipate is that there are some sensors that are a little bit faulty and run low. Um, and they, these are man-made objects. And also where you put them on the arm um, makes a big difference. And I know you're probably talking, I find the upper third of the arm behind the shoulder where I used to have a muscle there, it's gone now. It used to be the deltoid muscle, right tucked behind that kind of little muscle. If you're putting them too far front of the arm, if you're putting them anywhere where the filament can get nudged or, or knocked, Sometimes anything that sensor filament underneath your skin is ridiculously sensitive. It's supposed to be sensitive, but if it's moved there, there are just some things And I tell people, if it doesn't feel right, if you're getting a couple of days of low readings, don't jump up and down and get excited or think that you're too low. It's probably the sensor. You've got a, you've got a sensor that's just reading low. Um, unfortunately, it kind of tends to skew your averages if you're, if you're wearing that sensor for, for a while for a lot of my patients. But these are man-made you know, objects, just like going and buying a toaster and it's not, you gotta take it back because it's not working as well. Just question that if you're getting a lot of lows. Great. And what about, uh, does uh, perimenopause and menopause, how does that affect blood sugar levels? Hormones can go in either direction, um, that kind of perimen for, for women. Um, and I, again, kind of speaking to, to your own GP, GP about that with, with, with either with supplements that you're taking or not, but I generally find um, that, you, you know, for a lot of women, it, 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 it'll depend on um, whether in, in that period, what's happening to your weight. I think weight gain or weight associated weight gain with that menopausal phase is what so sort of an indirect effect of it, um, not, not a direct effect of, of changing hormone levels, if that makes sense. So it's not the hormones themselves, it's the effect of what the hormones are doing to the rest of your body. Right. And we see so a lot of, you know, insulin resistance rises when you go into menopause and perimenopause, that whole shift begins to happen. Exactly, it's the effect, it's the effect of every, it's the knock on effect of what that's doing. Um, okay, well, we've been busy. I knew you would be busy, Sarah. Are there any more questions out there? Maybe I'll just open the screen up um, if people just wanted to ask Sarah anything in person. You are such a wealth of knowledge, Sarah, and I've learned so much uh, from you too about the sensor, <laughs> what's going on with these things and how do we 
how do we use them? How do we judge them a little bit? Game changing though, it's fantastic to have. I mean, I I was talking to another colleague and saying, look for 20, 30 years of me sitting with patients really getting involved in what they're eating and what they're doing to have a device that gives you instant feedback and and data in real time. It's like, gosh, I ate that, look what that popcorn did. Gosh, I did that. You know, it's kind of a, a registered dietitian's dream to have that to help. And I've used it, you know, my, my, we've all used it. And I think it's, it, we're very lucky in these countries and jurisdictions where we can have it um, to make wise choices, which can put us on a healthy end of the spectrum. I was at a, a diabetes conference in Lisbon in December and realizing just how many countries don't have access to it. And yay to a world, and it's going to take decades where we do have CGM more readily available to people. Because for me, when I'm imparting or sharing nutrition knowledge, for then someone to be able to go home and look at that and investigate it in real time is is really, really fantastic and meaningful. And people become, you know, really attached to these devices and and use it as as their little conscious sitting on conscience sitting on your shoulder or it's just becomes your little buddy. Some people get quite angry at them, but hey, if you scan it, you've had a cookie and it tells you something, it tells you something, you know, embrace that. That's something that you can learn and and see. Um, Somebody said to me today, he's learned just how many French fries he can get away with. Well, you know, it's teaching you something far and far between, but more to the point of showing you what's possible in um, disease prevention and wellness. And I think it's a fantastic tool. And I think what you all, what we're participating with this challenge um, is fantastic and wish everybody the best of luck and, and enjoy it. Well, thanks scan so much, away. The more you scan, the more you learn. The more you scan, the more you learn. And I think that's been so far what's been going on with people from the questions I've been getting behind the scenes. So thank you so much, Sarah. You know, it's wonderful to hear that this is a game changer tool for you. You know, as a dietitian that's been in this industry and working with patients for 30 years, this can be game changer. And for those that are really trying to understand their health more, this is why becoming more aware of your body, the patterns that are going on, it's gonna get you onto that pathway to wellness. So thanks for being with us tonight, Sarah. And um, we'll be talking soon. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow.